Hey Architect Nation, Enix Sears here from Business of Architecture and I wanted to take you on my little walk and talk today. I have a question for you today and the question is, are architects killing the profession? Are architects killing the profession? Now, you may think this is a strange question. Why would architects be killing the profession? Because architects are the profession. Right? Architects are who make up the profession of architecture. Well, I, was, I had a couple of experiences recently that really brought this to the forefront of my mind. I'm, on here, I'm over here in Europe on a trip with my family here in London for a month. And yesterday, I had the opportunity to talk with an architect. And I talk with, you know, three or four or five, six or seven, anywhere from three, three to 10 to 20 architects, firm owners every single week. And these are, these are firm owners of small firms. When I say small firms, I probably mean more micro firms. So firms anywhere from sole practitioners up to firm owners that have, say, 15 to 20 employees, right? This is what I call the micro practice. And as I was talking with this architect, make sure I don't get run over here, since I always forget which side of the street the cars go on. As I was talking with this architecture firm owner, he just, he was telling me about a lot of the struggles he was having in his practice. And these are, these are struggles that I hear architects having again and again and again, especially when I, in this particular segment of the industry, which is the small firm architects. And he said, look, so right now I'm working for Peanuts. He's like, I do a lot of work for developers. I do multifamily housing. I mean, this architect has almost 30 years of experience, does amazing designs, provides exceptional value to his clients, and yet he's struggling day to day. He's working three times as hard as, well, he gave, he gave an example of his brother who's an accountant. And he said that his brother who's an accountant just built this huge, beautiful estate in Southern California. He has a beautiful pool. He works 40 hours a week, making tons of money. And so here's this architect who's been working his entire career and just feels like he's not getting ahead. He feels like he doesn't really have a whole lot to show for it. He feels like he's getting pushed down and beaten down on fees all the time. And that his work and what he does and the value that he brings to project isn't, is not valued by his clients. And so as we begin to talk about this, you know, I just remembered that this is something that I hear architects talking about again and again and again. And I see this in terms of both a macro issue affecting the profession as a whole and also a micro issue where it comes down to a very personal level. Like this architect who literally doesn't know where to go is frustrated because he feels like he's seen a decline in the profession. And this is another thing that I hear people talking about a lot is that over the years, and we're talking decades here, is that there has been a decline in the prominence of architects, their role in the respect they get from clients, how they operate. So we've seen at the macro level, we've seen consolidation of architectural services. Uh, for instance, you know, Gensler right now is the ar largest architecture firm in the world. And pardon me if there's a bit of wind noise right here. Head on down this suit, there might be a little bit less. So Gensler, of course, is the largest architecture firm in the world. However, what's interesting is that a lot of the large companies that do most of the architecture around the world are actually not architecture firms. So Gensler is actually an outlier. Gensler is and the, the exception of the rule. We have other firms like, like ARUP, ARUP. We have firms like AECOM. These are huge mega organizations that provide AEC services, con contracting services, building services, construction management, architectural services, engineering services. And so in the past where it seems architects, now I started my career in after 2000, I graduated from architecture school in about 2000 and 2002, if I remember correctly. So I've been in this industry for near 20 years, um, both as an intern architect and now as a licensed architect. And what I find that over this time period, that I have seen sort of a consolidation of the, of architecture. I've seen the slippage, right, in my short career. But when I talk to architects that have been around a lot longer in the industry, what I hear from them is that this isn't something new. You know, we see the consolidation where these larger companies have taken the role of where the architects used to lead in the process. Now we have other stakeholders coming in like uh, design build firms, we have construction managers, we have owners representatives, and this is on the, this is of course in the, in the, um, in the market where architecture firms are working with large businesses, corporations doing institutional work. Now, when we look at the residential sector, you know, single family residential architects, they still do play a large part, but even we're seeing slippage there where design build firms are coming in. You have builders doing the architecture, you know, less than 1% of the housing in the United States 
is actually designed by architects. And I have a feeling that's the same around the world, if not greater. Of course, the question comes up, should that be the case? Should architects be designing homes? Well, that's a whole nother issue. I mean, I would say absolutely yes, because architects are the ones that have the design skills. They're the ones that are trained in architecture to be able to create living built environments. So let's get back to this idea of slippage. So when we look at the slippage that's happened in the industry, architects are facing this, this erosion of the profession right now. And what I mean by erosion is erosion of control, erosion of respect, erosion of ability to um, to influence the built environment. And so going back to this conversation that I had with this architect, you know, this is now, now we got to zoom in on the personal level, right? So we talked about the macro level where we have these larger companies who are taking over and they're getting all the large contracts and you have things like public private partnerships and architects are playing a very, very small role in a role that I believe is shrinking. On the personal level, we see architects, you know, in the United States consistently, uh, the, the salary of an architecture firm owner is somewhere around, according to the recent Architect Magazine Salary Survey, Compensation Survey Report and AI Studies, is around 70 to, uh, about, you know, kind of 70,000 US dollars, which could be considered a decent salary, but not if you live in a metropolitan area, not if you have a family, not if you're a sole provider, not if you need to pay for health insurance. I mean, really in today's world in the United States, that's not enough money to survive. And the interesting thing here is if you actually worked at another firm, you would be earning more money. So if you look at architects that have anywhere from 15 to 20 years of experience that are working at a larger firm, they're going to be commanding fees, they're going to be commanding salaries of $80,000, $90,000, $120,000 plus they're going to be getting benefits. And so we can see the disparity just from the numbers of these small architecture firm owners. Now this doesn't apply across the board. Of course there are outliers, there are firm owners out there who are absolutely crushing it, who have small firms who are bringing home very great incomes. I, I know an architect in Chicago who's last year he brought home, brought home net to himself $800,000 in the residential single family market. So I'm not saying that it can't be done. What I'm saying is that by and large, when we look at the averages, this is what we're seeing. And this is how we can start to gain conclusions and takeaways and try to figure out what's at the root of this. What is, what is happening here? And so now we go back to the question that I asked earlier, which is, are architects destroying the profession? And so what I see from my position talking to hundreds and hundreds of architects every month and over the course of the past decade of doing this and being involved in this industry and talking with architects and consulting with architects, this is a common, a common issue is that architects, because they love design so much, and I'm an architect myself, so I get it. Because we love to design, we're passionate about what we do. We literally will lower our pants to be able to do a project and do a design. And so ultimately what happens is other people like the lawyers, the contractors, other business people, they play upon this and they take advantage of this ethical nature of the architect who wants to do good work, who money is important, but it may not be the number one most important thing. And so ultimately what happens is architects end up slashing their fees to try to compete for projects. And I hear this again and again and again from clients are saying, Enoch, you know, I don't know how this firm is doing this. They, they're, they're way under what I could even afford to do the project for. And so what we have is we have this systematic problem throughout the industry where there's like, you know, just like a, a raising tide raises all boats. Well, I would say the same thing probably applies. I don't know if there's a saying for that, but a lowering tide sinks all boats, right? And so what we have now is we have this lowering tide of architects who are competing based upon price because they want to get the product, they want to, they love design so much, they're willing to slash their fees and drop their pants to be able to get the designs. And so what ultimately happens is there's this disjuncture between the importance of finance, the importance of capital, the importance of money, and the importance of winning the projects that you want to win and being able to have that creative expression in your architecture firm. And so I don't think there's any one person or one firm to blame for this problem, but it's a systematic, system-wide, kind of industry-wide problem that architects need to come to grips with. And the, the root of this is a lack of understanding or maybe an ignoral of the importance of finance and design creativity. So a gap between the importance of finance and design creativity. Jonathan Siegel, he does great work in San Diego, 
good friend, he talks about whoever has, he talks about the golden rule, right? Whoever has the gold makes the rules. And because Jonathan Siegel understands this, he's been able to do some pretty impactful and influential and very interesting designs down in San Diego. All right, so I think that's a good example, a good case study of how it could be. Now, of course, he's, he's completely cut out the, the uh, across the street here, he's completely cut out the client, which is rather interesting as well. I know that idea appeals to a lot of architects. So where are we? Where are we now in this conversation about, about value? Why are architects basically cutting their own throats, slitting their own wrists, eating their own young to try to get projects that ultimately lowers the profile of the entire profession because ultimately what happens? Developers, clients, they know that they can get architectural services and design for pennies on the dollar. And so here's the problem. The problem is, is that architects don't understand for whatever reason, they don't understand, they undervalue their services. They undervalue their own value. They undervalue design. You know, when we look at the, the value that an architecture firm provides to a project or an architect provides to a project, sure, there's project management, there's, man, there's um, coordinating with contractors, there's construction documents, there's not making mistakes, there's meeting things on budget. There's all this, uh, you know, these are all important things. However, I would argue, and I think most architects would probably agree, that the biggest value that an architect can provide is in design, right? In that creative thinking, creative problem solving, coming up with, with creative solutions that not, might not have been seen before. An example, at one of the firms that I work with in Houston, where I was being mentored, a builder came to us who had a subdivision, and this subdivision was on the intercoastal waterway, and he was doing custom homes here. And based upon his plan, he had mapped out a certain number of, of lots that he was gonna use, and of course the idea here is to maximize the lots, but it's still at the same time to be able to provide big enough lots so their market rate, so people wanna buy those properties. Well, looking at the plan, the principal of the firm that I worked with realized that there was this unused portion of land running along kind of the, the, the access road here. And there was a giant, a giant berm there for, to prevent flooding, right? There's a levee there. And so in talking with the Army Corps of Engineers, he discovered that they were actually gonna allow us to build and design homes on that levee. So what was once totally unused land, we were able to add three or four, I think five or six lots that are now premium lots because they're raised up, they're overlooking, they can see the intercoastal waterway. And so just, just with that simple move, millions of dollars was added to this project. And this thing is something that plays out again and again and again. But here's the interesting thing. When you look at, I'm gonna take the example of architects who work developers because this is a very cutthroat industry. You know, the margins are slim, developers are very wise and savvy. And so they're always wanting to negotiate and, and beat down architects on their fees. And so when we look at this question of developers who are um, you know, hiring architects and architects trying to beat down their fees and doing it for free, what we have is this idea of spec work. So this happens a lot, you know, giving away free work. And so what, what developers, what, it, what, um, what happens in this industry is we have developers and again, you know, we, we've completely done this to ourselves, architects. What we have is that architects will give away They'll do, for instance, some schematic design. So developers will come to an architect and say, hey, can you give me some ideas for this property? Or architects will go to developers and say, hey, you know, I'd like to work with you. I'll give you some ideas for next project. So ultimately what ends up happening is that architects give away the most valuable thing they have, which is their IP, their ideas, their problem solving ability upfront for free. This is one small example of how architects do not value what they have. And so what's the solution here? What I would have you consider is that the solution is that architects need to understand, number one, their own value. They need to be confident and really understand the value that they bring to a project. With some sort of development project, we'd be talking about millions and millions of dollars. With a single family residence, we could be talking about resale value, but we could also be talking about other intangible items like quality of life, like family gatherings and things like that, right? Huge, huge value. And so until architects actually understand what that value is, there's not gonna be any sort of progress made. Now, the second thing is architects need to understand actually how to communicate their value. Because it's one thing to be able to understand your value and be confident and completely know and own the value that you're providing. But it's another thing to be able to communicate that value 
to potential clients in a way that gets them to be glad to open up their checkbook and pay architects premium fees. I was having a chat with a friend of mine just this morning actually who used to, she is an accountant and she used to work for Price Waterhouse Coopers. She's based out of Australia and she was just telling me that, you know, as an accountant and in that accounting firm, they would bill for six minute increments. Okay, they would bill for six minute increments. Now I'm sure your accountants probably do the same thing. Attorneys do the same thing. Fascinating. Architects, on the other hand, when we look at it, a lot of times architects are giving away work for free because they're a scope creep or something. They don't want to charge the clients. They feel bad about charging them. There were some overages, some unexpected things came up. And so we have almost the opposite thing happening in the architecture industry, whereas, whereas in accounting and law, these professionals seem to have a good handle on how they charge, the value they provide, and they're willing to charge for it. And on the other hand, architects give away and sell themselves down the river for a song and ultimately end up working for peanuts. Now, for a lot of architects, it's not a big deal because many architects, are, they have dual income. They maybe have a spouse who brings in an income or a spouse that gets health insurance. And so a lot of architects that I talk to that are in this market of smaller firms, you know, finances are not the primary issue. It's not like they're starving for money. They have a decent take-home pay. But when you look at it, they don't have the capital. And this is, where the, this is where the gap happens. They don't understand the role of financing and capital and how it relates to their end goal of being able to do more interesting, more creative projects, being able to have a, a better place at the table of stakeholders when a project gets done. Because there is a link there. And so ultimately what we have is that because architects don't understand their value, they don't necessarily know how to communicate that value. This is industry wide and they don't understand the role of capital in running a business. This is where we have the system wide problem that ultimately starts to affect architects all around the world, both in terms of employees, satisfaction, people leaving the profession. I mean, right now I was talking to a principal at a firm and he said that architects in my age group, I'm about four, I'm 42 right now. Architects in this age group are extremely difficult to have because in the last recession, a lot of us left the profession. I mean, I left the profession. I'm still a licensed architect, but I don't practice actively right now because, because of these issues, you know? And so for me, this is a mission. The reason why I stepped out of the profession and the reason why I'm recording this video is because I'm on a mission that this needs to change. And I believe that I can change it better in this way than practicing as an architect. So my call to you today is to stand up and take arms. If anything in this video has resonated with you, I would encourage you to share this with your other architectural friends and colleagues. I believe this is a rallying cry that we need to get behind each other. We need to understand this idea of number one, the value that architects provide. Number two, we need to stop devaluing our services. We need to start charging and understanding that to run a business, there's a, there's a link, a direct link between capital, how we allocate that capital, how we earn that capital in our business, how we track it, and the ability to have a say in the built environment. And what I submit to you, if you're a small architecture firm owner, you should not be running a firm. Well, let, let's put it this way. If you're not earning 20% income, then you are an irresponsible business owner. And look, I get it. Not every, not every architect actually understands their numbers and understands the profit they make. Maybe they want to make 10% and things like that, right? But if, and I will, <laughs> if a firm owner is not making 20% profit, ultimately what's happening is they're leaving a lot of money on the table that needs to be used to re, be reinvested into the business. And I know very few architects actually run their business this way. Most of them are like, if I'm earning a good salary, if I can pay my expenses, if I can pay my overhead, if I can pay my staff, then that's good. But they're not taking a long-term view of why it's important to actually have a 20% uh, profit. Part of that is so they can have cash reserves in case of the next recession. Another part of that is so they can actually have the funds to require and recruit the best talent. Another part of that is so that they can make strategic moves and they can maybe drop their fees when necessary to compete for projects, but not all the time. They know when to do it strategically as part of a big term picture. Again, so if you, if you hate this video and you totally disagree with me, that's great. Go ahead and leave a comment right below it. I would love to hear your thoughts. Take me to task on anything that I've said today, but if something resonates with you, again, I would encourage you 
to share this message, whether you're living, listening on the podcast or whether you're watching this on a video, share it with other architects that you know. Let's have a conversation about this. What is the solution? What's happening in the industry? And how can we begin to take back the industry? And when I say take back, take back from the erosion that's, in it, that's been happening that's almost so subtle it's almost invisible so that architects can begin to be again even heightened themselves as leaders in the built environment applying all of that design knowledge. Well, you know what to do. If, if you don't care, fine, just close this video, turn off this podcast, go back to work and forget that we have this conversation. But if you believe that there is hope for the future, you do believe in architecture, you do believe in the power that architects have to influence the built environment, I invite you to share this on social media, friends, however you like to do it with colleagues, and let's get a conversation started about this. Now, it is a little chilly here. I'm gonna go head back into my apartment, and as always, this is Enix Sears. You can look me up at businessofarchitecture.com, and I'd like to remind you, as always, carpe diem. Seize the day. Bye for now.